Saskatchewan. Start somewhere inside its borders, pick a direction, and you can drive for hours without ever leaving. A land as vast and varied as its rich history. It doesn't matter where you begin or where you end. It doesn't matter if you're moving or standing still. The place will come to you. It will whisper to you. It will tell you stories. It's a place full of stories. Stories of culture, stories of survival, stories of accomplishment, and stories of people. It will capture your imagination. It will become a part of you. It will move you. They are the stories that echo in the hallowed halls of our imagination. They start somewhere out there and become larger, larger than life itself. They are the stories that move reality to a place where time forgot. They are the timeless, the limitless legends of Saskatchewan's history. There's a lot of people that wanted that body. They wanted to have the body that they had to pay any sum of money. Like uh, even in France, uh, Paris would have given any sum of money to get that body up there. Born and raised on his family farm near Willow Bunch, Saskatchewan, Edouard Beaupre grew to a height of eight feet, three inches tall. At 15 years of age, he was larger than most full-grown men and began to work as a cowboy. His career, however, was short-lived as his great size conspired against him. By the age of 17, his feet would touch the ground while seated on his mount. Furthermore, his weight proved too much for any horse he rode. No longer a cowboy, Edward still proved his usefulness around town. He could lift an 800-pound horse with his legs and was frequently called upon to ply that strength to the day-to-day -day happenings of life in Willow Bunch. An idea was soon struck by a close friend of the Beaupre family that Edouard might be able to make a living touring with a freak show. So the 17-year-old became known as the Willow Bunch Giant and toured through cities all across North America. On July 2nd, 1904, Edouard was performing with the Ringling Brothers Circus at the World's Fair in St. Louis. That night, 15 minutes after completing a show, his health took a dramatic turn for the worse. Suddenly, Edouard began to complain of chest pains. He began to cough and spit blood and felt a burning sensation in his lungs. Edouard declared that he was dying. He said he was sad to be dying so young and so far away from his parents. He arrived at the hospital unconscious and died shortly thereafter at 1.15 a.m. He was 23 years old. Edouard's body was transferred to the St. Louis morgue where Dr. R. B. H. Gradwall performed the autopsy that same day at 6 p.m. Blood clots were found in his lungs. Tuberculosis was the cause of death. Edouard's body was then transferred to Eberl and Keyes Undertakers where he was embalmed and prepared for burial. Edouard's family was poor and did not have the means to have his body returned home. Stuck with the bill, the morticians decided to recoup their expenses by displaying Edouard's body in a store window. But police soon got wind of the scheme and shut it down. The morticians tried again in a different location, and again the police shut it down. The body was then shipped to the Eden Museum in Montreal, where it was displayed for six months to enthusiastic crowds. The exhibit space proved too small for the size of the crowds Edouard's body had attracted. Authorities ordered a change of venue. Two and a half years later, children discovered the body in a shed of Belle Reve Port in Montreal. A circus had apparently forgotten it there after going bankrupt. A professor of anatomy with the University of Montreal paid $25 to have the body transferred to the campus's anatomy department. 
He then mummified it and preserved it in a sealed glass case, where it could be later observed and studied. In the mid-1960s, Edouard's surviving family was shocked to learn that he was still on display at the University of Montreal. A photograph of his body was discovered in a medical textbook. They had previously believed that he was buried in St. Louis in 1904. Ovila L'Esperance, Edouard's nephew, took up the task of getting the body home, but was surprised to encounter resistance from university authorities. Nobody's going to have that body, even myself. So I said, that's not fair. So that's why I was forcing to get the body back to have him give him a decent burial. The university wanted to ensure that the body would not wind up in another exhibition. So uh, they said, what are you going to do with it? Well, I said, if I get him to a bunch, I said, I'll bury him, yeah. So uh, they said, the best way we can do he said, is to, uh, to cremate him. Well, I said, I don't care, I said, as long as I can bring him back to a bunch. On July 1st, 1989, nearly 84 years to the day of his passing in St. Louis, Edouard's ashes were buried at a family gathering in Willow Bunch. Over 200 people attended the ceremony. Most all of them had never even met the giant, but the importance of granting Edouard Beaupre a lasting peace made for an emotional gathering. Edouard Beaupre remains a part of the community to this day. His life-size statue greets visitors to the Willow Bunch Museum, where an exhibit dedicated to his memory can be found. Edouard remained in death as famous as he was in life. The Willow Bunch giant was no tall tale, as the headlines once proclaimed. They sometimes forgot, however, that their giant was also a human being, deserving of the dignity befitting any soul who ever walked the earth. The game, famous for its legends, came to Saskatchewan, where it spawned even more legends. They had nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to be. They found a home, and they never left. Indian Head's ball team was actually called the Jacksonville Eagles, and they played winter ball down in the States, and then they would come up here in the spring. A lot of them were barnstorming black ball players, but it was later on that they went into fame to play in the big leagues. When they played here, it always seemed very difficult for us to understand that the players weren't welcome as black players to be integrated into the white baseball machines down in the States. In the late 1940s and 50s, barnstorming black ball players came from all over the United States to play baseball in Canada. Baseball in the U.S. was segregated, and anyone who wanted to play at a high level in that country needed to come to Canada. These players were welcomed into the communities as heroes. When the ball players came to Indian Head, they lived on the main street, and the kids were running around talking to the players, getting autographs. They were heroes, really. It was our hometown team. We adopted them. Our caliber was semi-pro, and we had a number of the ball players that came here eventually went on to play in the Major League environment as well. One perfect example, I guess, was Tom Alston, who was the first baseman for the Indian Head Rockets. And then he went on to become the first black player that ever played for the St. Louis Cardinals. Other famous ball players who came to Saskatchewan include three players from the 1919 Chicago Black Sox who were banned from baseball. Pat Felch, Swede Reisberg, and Eddie Chicote. Other famous players included Buck O'Neill, Cool Papa Bell, and one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history, Satchel Paige. They played basically to make a living. They estimated the crowds at 20,000 for the two days. We referred to them as Western Canada's greatest baseball tournaments. And into the 50s, we became known as having Canada's greatest ball tournaments. CKRM, CKCK, and CHAB would all be down here to announce the results and of the play-by-play -play of the final games of these tournaments. In July of 1952, the Florida Cubans defeated Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 5-3 to three in the final game. We as kids would usually go out on the outside perimeter of the ball diamond, and we would usually try to crawl through the grass to see if we could get in free. There'd be music. In some cases, they would also have a, a small midway. 
and each of the churches would serve soup and sandwiches and, and hot dogs in the small concessions. It really was almost a little bit of a carnival environment. In the mid-1950s, the color barrier was all but gone in Major League Baseball. More opportunities for black ball players opened up in the United States. A lot of the black players started to break the barrier. It was quite significant. That's when we determined that they, they were kind of more heroes to us after having the opportunity to start here. And it was kind of gratifying because someone like Tom Alston would send autographed cards back to the people of Indian Head. The players might have left us, but their memories remain. The passing years have done little to fade them. They remind us of different times, of simpler times, and of changing times. To quote baseball's greatest pitcher, Satchel Paige, don't look back, something may be gaining on you. In the 1940s, when many women were expected to help with the war effort, an American entrepreneur decided it would be a good idea to launch a women's baseball league. The All-American Girls Professional Baseball League started in 1943 by the gum magnet in Chicago, Philip Wrigley. He was the owner of the Chicago Cubs and was very, very concerned that baseball was undergoing phenomenal change because most of the players were serving their country overseas. And as a result, he decided it would be sort of neat to have a women's baseball league. The challenge of finding talented players led scouts to Saskatchewan. Now, at this particular time in Saskatchewan, the women were playing in literally hundreds of leagues at a very, very high level. Scouts came from uh, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League up to Saskatchewan, and 26 women from our province were chosen. One of the women recruited was longtime ball player Arlene Johnson Noga. The scout approached me after a game and asked if I'd be interested in playing professional baseball. This was in year 1944. I took the bus down to Ogama and consulted with my parents. We decided I should sign a contract, so I did, and reported to spring training then in 1945. The basics of the game were not the only focus of training camp. In the evenings, the women were required to attend charm school, where they were versed in etiquette and personal hygiene. Players were also given a beauty kit and instructions on how to use it. It was Mrs. Wrigley who designed this uniform, and it was the uniform that all teams had to use if they were going to be a member of the league. After spring training, players who made the cut were allocated to teams and played a round of exhibition games. The games were exciting and competitive, as each team had a number of talented players. One thing that drew our fans back was the caliber of ball that the girls were able to produce. And it just was the most intensive ball series that I had ever encountered. The league quickly attracted fans, tripling season attendance within the first three years. Many of the games drew crowds of 5,000 or more. The league thrived for many years, but decentralization in the 50s, as well as a declining fan base, forced it to shut down. Even though the league was gone, it was not forgotten. The National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown was uh, the first Hall of Fame that contacted us, and they recognized our league, uh, not individual players, and that would be in 1988. In 89, the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame inducted individually the 64 Canadian players. 91, the Saskatchewan Baseball Hall of Fame recognized the Saskatchewan girls. In 1992, the All-American Girls Baseball League gained even more recognition through the release of the movie A League of Their Own. Canadian players were invited to Chicago to interact with the actors and add authenticity to the movie. We would throw with them and run and talk to them, have discussion sessions. It was so encouraging to see how enthusiastic these actresses were. They were determined that they were going to be ball players. The All-American Girls Baseball League was a great opportunity for 26 Saskatchewan players to add a Canadian component to an All-American game. The era that it existed in, the ladies uh, were expected to be in the home and not compete in sports. It was a beginning of ladies being accepted in the sporting world and I think we're very pleased to have been part of that. Some legends are made over time. 
They start off just like every other story, but something happens. Something extraordinary that transcends normal. And those legends are still among us, still around, just being legends walking amongst the crowd. The Regina Rams have an enduring legacy in Saskatchewan of tradition, excellence, and pride. In 1964, Gord Curry became the head coach. From that time, they've had great success. Over the next 33 years, the Rams won 22 league championships, 17 Western championships, and 15 national championships. They never finished lower than second place in the standings. By the spring of 1998, the Rams felt they had accomplished everything they could in the junior ranks. For us, we needed a greater challenge. The last six years that we were in the Junior League, we won the Canadian Championship five times. And what we really needed to do was challenge ourselves as a program as a whole, including directors and everything else. The idea of representing the University of Regina in the Canada West University's Athletic Association had been around for some time. But on May 6, 1998, that idea became a reality. In their first season of university football, the Rams did not win a game. Their second season proved to be a Cinderella story, however. They went all the way to the national championship. Because the team is so reliant on local support, they make it a priority to give back, assisting charities such as the Regina Food Bank, Razor Reader, and the Salvation Army. The fact that we have to raise funds within the community makes us reach out to the community. Academics are also a priority. The players are encouraged to excel in their post-secondary studies through scholarship programs offered by the club. We would like more academic All-Canadians, those that are going to have 80% plus in their degree programs. We want more of our players to be successful in school with degrees. We want more of our players to be uh, leaders in the community. The Rams' focus on player development and community have made them more than just a winning football team. I think that we are noticed because we are successful on the field. The scoreboard will look after itself and give credibility to what we're trying to accomplish as a program in, in total. Some legends live in dark places. Dark reminders of the living things we must strive to protect. These are the stories that moved on before the happy ending could find them. A fire truck came up close at hand and uh, hooked up a fire hose to spray the people on the street. And one of the uh, strikers found an axe and was about to chop the fire hose and was shot dead with a shot in the heart by the chief of police. By 1931, the Great Depression had ground the mining community down to a point where they were forced to take action. Low coal prices caused mine operators to cut costs, which compromises safety and well-being of mine workers. The mine had bad working conditions, in some cases uh, a lot of water. This had to be pumped out of the mines and that was done on the miners' own time. Miners worked 14 to 16 hours a day and they believed they were being cheated by the company. The company was weighing their loads and the men believed that they weren't getting uh, fair weights on the coal that they were sending up. Miners were forced to live in and rent company houses, which meant one large part of their income was going straight back to the company. In some cases, the company also owned the store, so you were obliged to buy your goods from the store. You got whatever money was left over after they deducted their rent and their take for the groceries you bought. It was strongly suggested to you that you better buy groceries from them. There was one case where a person had dared to buy some clothing from Eaton's. The person involved actually had to pay the difference between what he had saved and what it would have cost him in the store. The miners decided it was time to organize and join a union. In the early 1930s, none of the traditional unions were willing or interested in organizing these coal miners in southwestern Saskatchewan. So they eventually turned to the Mine Workers Union of Canada, which was a communist-affiliated union. And the communists were willing to organize them, and so they did so. Even though the majority of workers joined the union, mine operators refused to recognize or bargain. In early September, the miners went on strike. 
Attempts were made to break the strike. In one case, they couldn't do it because the strikers happened to own the water supply and they wouldn't supply water from their well to the scabs. So mine after mine was tried and in each case, they were unsuccessful in breaking the strike. Finally, in late September, the coal miners decided to have a sympathy parade through downtown Estevan. As news of the parade spread, the Estevan Town Council passed a motion that no parades or demonstrations would be allowed. They called in the RCMP to enforce their decision. On September 29th, a procession of 63 cars and 400 people made their way into Estevan. Upon entering the town, the parade was immediately met by a police barricade. It wasn't long before trouble erupted. One of the strike leaders had a quarter-inch lath that is used for putting in between wood when you're drawing it. And he tipped the hat off of the chief of police. He realized he made a mistake and he dropped the lath, but that was enough. And then they began beating on him and arresting him. The riot raged for nearly an hour until RCMP reinforcements arrived and the crowd dispersed. Three men were shot and killed by the RCMP. Dozens of others were wounded. What happened afterwards is that the Espen riot brings an end to the strike. They don't get what they want. Their union is not recognized. As with the police, they get a black eye. If you go to Beanface, Saskatchewan, the three dead miners are buried there and the headstone reads, murdered by the RCMP. Saskatchewan boasts many famous characters. Tommy Douglas, John Diefenbaker, even Brent Butt. But the province was also home to at least one legendary outlaw. Sam Kelly. He was notorious for his flaming red hair and beard, and so that led to one of his aliases, Red Nelson, and he was also a crack shot. Sam Kelly apparently could dehorn a steer from 50 yards with his rifle. Kelly was born in Nova Scotia in 1859, and when economic troubles hit the Maritimes, he moved west. Once in Saskatchewan, he joined forces with the Frank Jones Gang. They operated along the Saskatchewan-Montana border, robbing banks, trains, and individuals. They stole horses, they stole cattle, and of course they would steal anything of value, such as the saddles or a harness was popular, because anything that could be resold, they stole, but they were always good to their neighbors, and the neighbors had to be good to them. Kelly and his gang settled in Big Muddy, an area that is close to the border and pocketed with caves where the gang could hide out. I think he chose that area because it's relatively isolated. There's not a lot of settlement in the Big Muddy area, and he could work both sides of the border, so he could commit a crime on one side and run off the other side and vice versa. They weren't the only gang in the Big Muddy, and Sam Kelly became acquainted with other notorious outlaws. They had a couple of caves, one cave for their horses, another cave for themselves, and they also had escape hatches. So it was very elaborate. They had lookouts, and so by this means, they eluded capture. In an attempt to police the gangs, the RCMP established a depot in 1902. Despite the efforts of the RCMP, Sam Kelly's shrewdness enabled him to elude capture. But the years of life on the run took a toll on him. Sam apparently tired of the gangster life, the outlaw life. He tried ranching, and then in 1913 he came up to Debden, north of Blaine Lake, and he took out a homestead. And he homesteaded in the area, but people say that he was never quite comfortable. He always was nervous because he always believed that someone was going to try and find him and settle some score with him. Sam Kelly continued to live in Debden until he was found one day hungry and confused at a bus stop in Smeaton. Kelly was committed to a mental institution in Battleford until his death in 1937. Today, Sam Kelly's legacy lives on in the big muddy badlands, where his old hideout is marked and remembered as the Sam Kelly Caves. Some legends are made over time. Some legends are made of nothing at all. They are the stories that missed the bus, forgot the phone number, dressed for the wrong occasion. They are the legends we love because they are the legends that remind us of ourselves. Nessie, the world-famous monster from Loch Ness, and Ogopogo, a legendary creature renowned in British Columbia, both have something in common, a rival of legendary and monstrous proportions that many people say lives in Turtle Lake. There were lots of people coming in and saying they had seen this, 
thing out in the lake and they didn't know what it was, but it was really scary and had humps on it. And one man came in and said, well, it looked like a big, long log, and then it started moving. Not all eyewitnesses agree on what the Turtle Lake monster looks like. According to some, it has the head of a pig, while others say a horse or a dog. Some claim that it has a long tail. The first stories of the Turtle Lake monster go back nearly a hundred years. It's rumored to have ripped fishing nets, caused cracks in the lake's winter ice, and there are even those who suggest that the creature is responsible for unexplained drownings. There are several theories concerning the Turtle Lake monster's origin. Some believe that it is a sturgeon that got into the lake years ago when the North Saskatchewan River flowed through Turtle River into Turtle Lake. Sturgeon are definitely odd looking. They are torpedo shaped and have a tough leather-like hide. Sturgeon are large fish growing up to six feet long and have been known to live more than 100 years. Others believe that the creature might be a plesiosaur a prehistoric marine reptile with a long neck, short tail, and paddle-like limbs. I think he's friendly and I don't think he's going to hurt anybody. I think just leave him alone and let him do his thing. With almost a century of legends, stories, and rumors, the Turtle Lake monster is rightly taking his place beside his more famous cousins. We were just walking down there, and all of a sudden the light appeared behind us, like the light of a train, like, you know. As we turned around, we seen it, and then all of a sudden it just disappeared. Outside the village of St. Louis, a mysterious light has become the focus of a legend more than 50 years old. Along the site of an abandoned rail line, many people claim to have seen an unexplained light, a ghost train in the darkness. Legend has it that in the 1920s, a CNR engineer was checking the tracks near St. Louis when he was struck and decapitated by a train. Some believe the light is the engineer's ghost searching for his missing head. The sensational tale of the wayward ghost and the mysterious light has attracted interest from around the world. There's been thousands of people, I would say, oh, thousands. Uh, I have phone calls and got interviewed from part of the world, like even from New Zealand and different countries that people that come and contacted me and want to know more about it. Two high school students from La Ronge decided to find out the truth behind the ghost light. Their science fair project demonstrated that the light could be caused by the illumination of cars changing lanes close to the tracks, a scientific phenomenon known as diffraction. Whether the strange light in St. Louis is caused by a supernatural ghost train or some rare scientific phenomenon, people continue to seek out the experience for themselves and keep the legend alive. A friend of mine lives in Tway over here and, and he phoned me one night, he said he had some friends that wanted to go see that phantom light. And uh, so he, they went and uh, the next day, a couple of days after I asked him, did you see it? Don't even talk about it, he said. It scared the dickens right out of us, he said. The legends in Saskatchewan are as important as every other Saskatchewan story. They bring all the cool people to the party. They put the gas in the tank. They make the plot twist. They take their place among all the other Saskatchewan stories. They make our place in the story an easier one to find. <laughs>